Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in Industry and More. So we are continuing our danger bearing areas. So last session we finished uh, the same in maxilla. So this session is about mandible. So we'll go with the same uh, uh, structures that is the limiting structures, supporting structures and relief areas of mandible. So we have limiting structures, labial frenum, labial vestibule, buccal frenum, buccal vestibule, lingual frenum, alveolar lingual sulcus, retromolar pad, and pterygo mandibular raphe. It's almost like the maxillary structures, um, but a little different. We have a retromolar pad and alveolar lingual sulcus and pterygo mandibular raphe in limiting structures of mandible. So let's see the details of danger bearing areas in mandible. So the first one is labial frenum. So labial frenum is a fold of mucous membrane at the median line. Okay. So this is a labial frenum. And it divides the labial vestibule into right and left. That is two halves. So this is a labial vestibule. So this labial frenum divides into two halves. Right and left halves. And it consists of band of fibrous connective tissue and helps to attach orbicularis oris muscle. Okay. This is uh, shorter and wider than the maxillary labial frenum. And uh, while taking impression, uh, we should give sufficient relief uh, without compromising the peripheral seal. Uh, so the frenum is quite sensitive and active and the danger must be fitted carefully around it to maintain a seal without causing soreness. So that is the labial frenum. Now we have labial vestibule. So it runs from the buccal frenum. So this is a buccal frenum on right and left side. So it runs from buccal frenum uh, on the left side to the right side and it is divided into left and right by as I mentioned by labial frenum. So fibers of orbicularis oris incisivus and mentalis are inserted near the crest of the ridge. So this mentalis uh, muscle is an active muscle. So while taking impression uh, the extent of the danger, we should think that the extent of the danger flange in this region is often limited because of this muscle action. Because there are mus muscle fibers which are inserted close to the crest of the ridge. So thick danger flanges uh, may cause dislodgement of the danger when patient uh, opens the mouth very wide. So we need to think of those muscles which are seen in this region such as uh, orbicularis oris, mentalis and incisivus muscle. So whenever there is muscle action we need to uh, think of uh, the dislodgement. So muscle action should not be uh, hampered while taking impression or creating uh, the denture. So the next one we have buccal frenum. So we finished labial frenum and labial vestibule. Now we have the buccal frenum. Okay. So buccal frenum uh, forms a dividing line between the labial and buccal vestibule. So this is a labial vestibule and this is buccal vestibule. So it can be uh, U-shaped or V-shaped and it overlies the muscle depressor anculi oris. Okay. So you need to understand the muscle action in detail to have a very good picture of the danger bearing areas. So muscle should be taken care while taking impression, otherwise there will be dislodgement. So depressor anculi oris is present here. And also fibers of buccinator muscle attached to the frenum. So this relief of buccal frenum is very important because if it is not relieved, there will be displacement of the danger because of the muscle action. Now we have the buccal vestibule. Okay, it's the buccal vestibule. It extends from the buccal frenum to the retromolar pad. So this is a retromolar pad area. So it extends from buccal frenum to retromolar pad on both sides. And it is 
nearly right angle to the biting force okay so this area is right angle to the biting force this is what uh, is similar to the heart palate primary stress bearing area in maxilla so extent of this buccal vestibule is influenced by the muscle buccinator which extends from the modulus anteriorly to pterygo mandibular raphe so modulus uh, we already studied modulus is the intersection area where many muscles are getting attached near the angle of mouth so from that area to the pterygo mandibular raphe that is the extension so pterygo mandibular raphe will be here and the masseter muscle which contracts under heavy closing force and pushes inwards against the buccinator muscle to produce a masseteric notch in the disto buccal so masseteric notch will be coming here border of the lower denture so how it is forming it is by the action of masseter and buccinator when this masseter muscle contracts under heavy closing force and pushes inwards against the buccinator muscle creates a masseteric notch and what is the clinical significance so this disto buccal border of the lower denture should accommodate the contracting masseter force that is a muscle force so that the denture does not dislodge during heavy closing force so that is why we asking the patient to the mandibular movements opening and closing the movements in order to uh, record the masseteric notch properly and to balance in a harm or keeping in a harmony of this contracting forces that is a masseteric and buccinator muscle forces uh, next we have uh, the lingual frenum lingual frenum this is one lingual frenum it is a fold of mucous membrane existing when the tip of the tongue is elevated and it overlies the muscle genioglossus okay so there'll be genioglossus muscle here which takes the origin from superior genial tubercle so hope you remember the uh, genial tubercles superior and inferior one on the inner side of uh, midline of mandible and the anterior region of lingual flange is called sublingual crescent area so there should be always a crescent shaped area of our lower denture near the lingual frenum and the relief of lingual frenum should be registered during our function a short frenum is called tongue tie so hope you heard this word tongue tie and it should be corrected if it affects the stability of the denture tongue tie should be uh, relieved uh, by a surgical procedure uh, to avoid the dislodgement of denture in muscles action that is the tongue muscles and the other muscle action and the next part is alveololingual sulcus so alveololingual sulcus is a space between the tongue so here we can imagine a tongue so it is a space between tongue and the residual ridge so it extends from lingual frenum to the retro mylohyoid curtain so it here it is a retro mylohyoid curtain and it has basically three regions anterior region middle region and posterior region so anterior region extends from lingual frenum uh, back to where mylohyoid muscle curves above the level of sulcus that is a premyeloid fossa then the middle region extends from premyeloid fossa to the distal end of mylohyoid ridge so mylohyoid ridge will be here where the mylohyoid muscle is attached and the posterior region here the flange passes into the retromyelohyoid fossa so retromyelohyoid fossa is not able to uh, shown in this type of picture it should be a side view picture this is a uh, top view picture and it has a typical s shaped form the anterior middle and the posterior region and the clinical significance is the lingual flange of lower denture will be short anteriorly than posteriorly and 
in the medial region it slopes medially towards the tongue so that is the importance of alveolo-lingual sulcus and next we have uh, the retromyeloid space we talked about retromyeloid space it is a uh, space which lies at the distal end of alveolo lingual sulcus okay so the distal end of alveolo lingual sulcus here we have a space known as alveolo lingual sulcus it is bounded anterior tonsillar pillar uh, anteriorly by tonsillar pillar posteriorly by the retromyeloid curtain so this is the terminal end of this alveolo lingual sulcus and what is that retromyelohyoid curtain so retromyelohyoid curtain is nothing but uh, formed posteriorly by the superior constrictor muscle laterally by the mandible and pterygomandibular raphe anteriorly by the lingual tuberosity and inferiorly by the myelohyoid muscle okay so there are many structures which is forming the retrohyoid uh, retromyelohyoid curtain posteriorly by the superior constrictor muscle okay laterally by the mandible and pterygomandibular raphe anteriorly by the lingual tuberosity and inferiorly by the mylohyoid muscle now the structure uh, we are moving on to the retromolar pad so it is a non keratinized triangular pear shaped pair of tissues at the distal end of lower ridge so the submucosa contains glandular tissues fibers of buccinator superior constrictor muscle pterygomandibular raphe terminal part of the tendon of temporalis and the retromolar papillae is a pear shaped area just anterior to retromolar pad okay so this is a retromolar papillae it is a dense fibrous connective tissue area okay so in retromolar pad we have structures the superior constrictor muscle pterygomandibular raphe and the temporalis so the clinical significance is the distal end of denture pad should cover the two-third of retromolar pad okay not completely but the two-third of retromolar pad and it provides a peripheral posterior seal for the lower denture it is almost like our pps post palatal seal area in mandibular denture we have retromolar pad which gives a posterior peripheral seal but we should cover only the two-third of the retromolar pad the last structure is pterygomandibular raphe so pterygomandibular raphe is very vital in taking uh, lower uh, denture or lower uh, arch impression because it is a tendinous insertion of two muscles so like i told when wherever the muscle action is there we should uh, take very much precaution so it arises from this pterygomandibular raphe arises from hamlar process of the medial pterygoid and gets attached to the mylohyoid ridge so it is coming and getting attached towards the mylohyoid ridge so it has superior constrictor muscle posterior laterally and buccinator anteriorly anterior laterally so posterior laterally and anterior laterally here we have superior constrictor and here we have buccinator so it is very prominent in some patients an arch like relief must be provided on the denture so relief should be there otherwise this buccinator and superior constrictor action will dislodge the denture now let's move to the supporting structures so supporting structures are the first one is uh, buccal shelf area and the residual alveolar ridge okay so supporting structures are buccal shelf area and residual alveolar ridge in maxilla we learn primary stress bearing area secondary stress bearing area primary was the heart palate and the slopes of this residual alveolar ridge again the rogue maxillary tuberosity alveolar tubercle becomes a secondary stress bearing area so buccal shelf area is the area between buccal frenum and anterior border of 
masseter muscle so this is the buccal frenum and the masseter muscle will be coming here we learned about masseteric notch from this area to this area that is the buccal shelf area so the boundaries includes medially the crest of alveolar ridge medially the crest of alveolar ridge distally the retromolar pad and laterally the external oblique ridge okay so laterally external oblique ridge medially the crest of ridge and distally the retromolar pad so the mucous membrane covering the buccal shelf area is loosely attached less keratinized and contain thick submucosa so buccal shelf area is a very important short note so the clinical significance that it lies at right angle to the vertical occlusal fossas and this makes it suitable for primary stress bearing area of lower tenure and the next one is residual alveolar ridge so the edangelous mandible may become flat due to resorption uh, which results into outward inclination and progressively widening of the mandible and also in maxilla the resorption is upward upward and inward and uh, making it a uh, smaller so it is the reason why the edangelous patients to have a prognathic appearance because this is maxilla it is going upward and inward whereas the mandible uh, resorption is happening which gives a widening of the mandible because of the outward inclination okay so the slopes of this residual alveolar ridge have thin plate of cortical bone so the slopes of this ridge act uh, at an acute angle to this occlusal fossas okay so it can be a secondary stress bearing area because it is the uh, area which bears a masticatory force at an angle not perpendicular so perpendicularly on the buccal shelf area so it is known as primary stress bearing area so since the crest of the ridge has cancellous bone it is not favorable as primary stress bearing area so clinical significance is any movable soft tissue overlying the ridge should not be compressed while making impression okay now let's move to the uh, relief areas so they are mental foramen genial tubercle mylohyde ridge and mandibular tori so mental foramen it is uh, between the first and second premolar region due to the ridge resorption it may lie close to the ridge so it should be relieved and in these areas uh, there are uh, nerve passing uh, it might compress the nerves and uh, it might create a problem in danger uh, wearing so uh again the paresthesia problem that is the numbness of lower lip will be there if it is not properly relieved and the dentro keeps on pressing on this nerves so mental foramen uh, should be uh, relieved the second one is a genial tubercle so genial tubercle are a pair of dense prominence at the inferior border of the mandible at the lingual midline which represents muscle attachment of genioglossus and geniohyoid muscle so they only become relevant in the denture when there is excessive resorption of the residual ridge so if you have a adequate uh, bone height it will not be a problem but if it, there is a resorption we need to relieve the genio tubercle to avoid the action of genioglossus and geniohyoid muscle now we have the mylohyoid ridge so mylohyoid ridge will be here is a bony prominence along the lingual aspect of mandible and soft tissue usually hides the sharpness of this mylohyoid ridge anteriorly this ridge uh, with mylohyoid muscle is close to the inferior surface of mandible posteriorly it often uh, flushes with the um, residual ridge so the mucous membrane overlying the sharp or irregular mylohyoid ridge needs to be relieved because the danger ways might easily traumatize it so we need to relieve mylohyoid ridge avoid in order to avoid the uh, traumatic effect on this by the denture base and the 
mandibular tori just like the palatal tori so these bony prominence which are found bilaterally on the lingual side near the premolar region so it should be relieved or it can be surgically removed before taking the impression so uh, that's all about uh, the danger bearing areas in mandible so we finished the entire session in both in maxilla and mandible so a sound knowledge of uh, anatomical landmarks of danger bearing areas are uh, very essential uh, to get the objective of a proper danger making so fabrication of any complete denture with maximum retention stability and support with preservation of underlying structures with a minimum post insertion problem requires a sound knowledge of all the anatomical landmarks that is the limiting structures supporting structures and relief areas of both maxilla and mandible so hope you understood the concept of danger bearing areas in mandible so it was a lengthy session uh, we had maxilla and mandible so the on an exam point of view we may have many questions from this chapter or this session uh, it could be a short note short essay or long essay so hope you understood this i'll come up with a new topic in professor on next thank you